So um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Juan Vale from the Christie, um, who's a consultant medical oncologist. Uh, I'd like to uh, th thank Cathy uh, for the kind invitation and for putting together uh, this day. Uh, and I, I really want to also start by thanking uh, Andrea, uh, Lynn, who's joined our team, uh, Mel and Gail, uh, who really pull the whole service together. So uh, by, by show of hands, really, just to thank the nurses for all the work that they do uh, in, in pulling the service together. Now, I've been given a bit of a difficult task to cover all medical therapies in about 20 minutes. And, and clearly, what, I'm not going to be able to do that in any great depth, but I'm very happy to meet up with, with you and have a chat and, and answer any questions. The, the, the title that was given to me was an overview of the medical management of neuroendocrine tumors. We're at the race course, beautiful site outside. You can see all the hurdles, uh, and I think what I wanted to just bring forward was the fact that we do have a number of hurdles to overcome in deciding what treatment we should be giving to what patient at what time. So I've changed my title slightly to read how do we decide which treatment, for whom and when. You've already heard about the multidisciplinary team. The UK is actually very good at doing this. We've had multidisciplinary teams for bowel cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer now for many years. We haven't had any specific national guidance to set up multidisciplinary teams for patients with neuroendocrine tumors. That aside, it didn't stop places like Liverpool and Manchester setting up multidisciplinary teams learning that this was in fact the right way to do it. I slightly take objection to the fact that the nurses see themselves as ringmasters because I think that makes me a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> but that aside, you can see that there are many people involved in your care. And what I often say to my patients is that what you don't see is the big team behind me. That core team involves oncologists, endocrinologists, we have surgeons both for liver surgery as well as bowel surgery or visceral surgery, nuclear medicine physicians, biochemistry, uh, radiology, nursing of course, pathology, psychological medicine, and then it's important that we get some of this information together with the help of research fellows and data managers. But that's not all. For added value, you also get, uh, the, the, I've added endocrinology in again, just because we sometimes have to deal with more complex endocrinology and, and, and genetics, for example, particularly when dealing with some of the inherited conditions. We sometimes need the cardiothoracic surgeons. Um, we, we sometimes need specialist biochemistry that isn't available locally. So for example, some of the reference labs that are done are only one or two places in the UK. We sometimes need cardiology, expertise in gastroenterology and interventional radiology. So you can see that is a lot of people looking after you. And in essence, when you come to our clinics, we are the messengers for the treatment plan that has been agreed by uh, not necessarily every member of that team every time, but uh, part of the team. What do we review? We review your history and we get as much information as we can. Uh, we review your scans, we review the pathology, uh, and uh, any results that are available in terms of biochemistry, for example. So we get as much information together as we can, and as has already been said, the nurse, if uh, she has already met you, works as your advocate. Because what none of these letters and scans will tell us is how fit somebody is and their social circumstances, uh, and that's where the nursing team uh, are, are pivotal. So, the first question that we decide, and I'm going to go through this presentation in a number of questions. What is it that we need to establish that will allow us to make a decision? So first of all, is it benign or is it malignant? Now the word tumor, if you look it up in the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, doesn't actually mean cancer. It doesn't mean it's malignant. It comes from the Latin. It means lump. That's all it means. So it's an abnormal growth of tissue in the body. That's what a tumor is. Some neuroendocrine tumors are in fact benign. 
by which we mean they don't spread, they don't go to other organs, they don't invade. They just stay as a very discrete nodule in whichever organ they've started, uh, and they don't actually in themselves cause any life-threatening problems. Depends on which specialty, so I won't see many benign uh, patients just because as an oncologist, as a cancer doctor, inevitably I will see patients who've had uh, malignant tumors. But in fact, uh, Professor Poston will probably touch on the fact that some of the benign tumors can be dealt with, uh, with, with locally and they, they need to be monitored uh, and they don't actually need to, to be escalated in terms of treatment. And sometimes, if benign, they can actually be very safely left alone. Uh, and so we need to put it into context. Not all the tumors that we're talking about are malignant. Having said that, from here on, my presentation will focus uh, on tumors that have uh, become malignant. <laughs> the next question, is surgery appropriate? It's amazing what you can find on Google. <laughs> This is a picture of our, uh, my, my friend and colleague, Professor Poston, uh, when, when uh, we're very lucky to have him uh, in, in the region. Uh, he, he's uh, an eminent surgeon, and, and this, is, this was published in the um, Oldham Chronicle when he was presented with, uh, I think it was the third person ever to be presented with a special award uh, by the Royal College of Surgeons in recognition of his achievement uh, in, in, in the field of surgery. So I don't feel at all empowered to answer that question, and I'll leave that to Professor Poston in the next presentation. But that is, in fact, one of the very first questions that we, we, we have to discuss at the team meetings. Can we do surgery? Because very often, if we can, that's the top one that we need to go with. The next question, are we dealing with excessive hormones? Now, you'll be aware of these terms called functional and non-functional tumors. In fact, most tumors are not functional. 60% are not functional, okay? This means that only 40% of, of tumors actually produce small amounts of chemicals or hormones. Let me just take a step back. These cells that become cancerous, in fact, we need them when we're healthy. So neuroendocrine cells are scattered throughout our body and they are regulating the function. They're keeping us ticking over and they're doing so by producing very small doses of hormones that uh, allow us to have secretions in the lungs, absorb the, the fluid from the bowel, absorb the nutrients from the bowel, for example. So all the time they're producing very small amounts of hormones in health. But if they've become uh, malignant, if they become cancerous, then those small amounts of hormones are then produced in much larger amounts. It's that exaggerated amount of hormone that can then sometimes cause what we call functional tumors. Those hormones are produced within the tumor itself, go into the bloodstream. Once in the bloodstream, that's when they can start causing problems like, for example, the carcinoid syndrome. And for patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, uh, a, a number of different hormones can be produced, insulin, glucagon, VIP, uh, and all of those are associated with different side effects. So if excessive hormones are a problem, first thing to think about is can we deal with this very simply? So very simple antidiarrheal treatments, for example. But you probably will be aware that the use of somatostatin analogs is now quite widely used. Somatostatin is also something that we normally make in health. So when our neuroendocrine cells are producing these small amounts of hormones, somatostatin is the, the brake pedal. So just as you're getting exaggerated amounts of hormones produced by the tumor, we can give an exaggerated amount of the brake pedal to slow it right down. And we know that with the monthly injections of somatostatin analogs, we can control the symptoms uh, associated with excessive hormones. There is some evidence that it can also slow down the cancer in some cases, uh, but it can also prevent some of the longer term complications. And by that I'm thinking, for example, uh, heart disease, which can happen in people who've had uh, carcinoid syndrome for uh, a very long period of time. Then as an oncologist, what I need to know is, if the tumor is malignant, how aggressive is it? 
We talk about neuroendocrine tumors as if it's one thing, but you're probably very aware that we're talking about a whole array of different conditions, some of which are much more aggressive than others. We can get that information from a CT scan. So if we do a scan three months apart, sometimes four, six months apart, uh, we can get a feel for how quickly things are changing, how quickly they're growing. Usually, we get the most useful information from the pathologist. And so the pathologist can look down the microscope and tell us and give us an idea of how aggressive they think the tumor is. And then we do a process akin to fingerprinting. It's not fingerprinting as such, but by using very special uh, chemical stains, we can stain the cancer cells that are dividing. So I hope you can see on the picture behind me, this is um, looking down the microscope at a tumor. You will see, I hope, a lot of blue. So all the little blue cells are cancer cells, okay? Scattered amongst them, you will see some brown cells or red cells. And those cells have been stained to show if they're dividing. So you can see that the number of the brown cells compared to the number of the blue cells it is what we would call moderate in, in, that, in, in that particular slide. The more brown you have, the more cells are dividing, the more aggressive it is. So we can get that information from the pathologist, and that's called a KI67 score, and we get, we get that as a percentage. So the pathologists then give us a grade, and they allocated a grade one, two, or three. So, just to give you a comparison, a grade one is, is a bit like a, a, a golden retriever. Friendly, 99% of the time, but it still has teeth, and if, occasionally, if you just push it a bit too far, it can, it can become a bit aggressive. Grade two, I feel, is a bit more like a boxer. You know, they're actually built to, 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 to fight. They're, they're built to be working dogs, uh, so a, a, bit, a bit less passive. Grade three tumors can be uh, much more aggressive. Uh, and, and I've deliberately chosen a very small dog there uh, because in fact, the most aggressive types of the neuroendocrine tumors are called small cell. Uh, and, and small cell um, uh, lung cancer, for example, is at the end of the more aggressive neuroendocrine tumors. So we get an idea of how aggressive it is and that also helps us to uh, decide which treatment we need to do at which time. Then the question is, does it need treatment right now? One of the most difficult things I have in my job is when patients are referred across through to me for chemotherapy, which means somebody then turns up at the doorstep and they're expecting to be told they're gonna to have chemotherapy. And after a long consultation and chatting about the MDT, I say, we're gonna do nothing. And I can see how difficult that would be for somebody to hear when they've been referred for what sounds like very active treatment. It's not always the right thing for everybody, but sometimes these tumors are so slow growing that nothing we can give is gonna slow it down any further. We don't need to intervene. And we call that watchful waiting. It's called various terms depending on where you go. And we get a feel for how things are behaving by an initial three-month scan. We repeat the biochemistry, the blood test. We see how you are. And sometimes that three months can become six months. And sometimes it can become a number of years before we actually see that we need to step in with some treatment. And I'd be very keen to hear back from you. What does that feel like for you as a patient when you come expecting treatment and then you're told uh, that we don't need to do anything? The next question is, is the liver the main problem? And I don't want to step on your talk too much, um, so I'm going to skip over the first two of surgery uh, and, and ablation. But we do know that the liver, as a natural filter in the body, will pick up a lot of these malignant cells. Some of them you will deal with because our bodies are programmed to deal with them and kill some of these cancer cells off. But inevitably, in time, some of them can take hold and grow and start causing a problem in the liver. Aside from surgery and ablation, uh, we sometimes use something called embolization, and we can add to that either chemotherapy or radiotherapy. 
Embolization just means that through one of the blood vessels in the groin, we can go up towards the liver, find the blood vessel that's feeding the tumors, and then we can inject something that will then shut down that blood supply. And like I say, at the same time, you can sometimes inject some chemotherapy or some radioactive beads. So just to show you what that looks like, if you look at the top slide, you can see there's a relatively round blush. I hope you can see that in gray. So that's actually a tumor within the liver. After the procedure, you can see that that's disappeared. Now, that doesn't mean that the tumor has completely gone. What that means is that you've shut off the blood supply to it, so you're no longer able to see the blood vessels uh, that are feeding it. That won't make it go away completely. It's not a cure. However, we know that it can result in better control of any syndrome, so it can reduce the amount of hormones that are being produced. Sometimes people have a very swollen, very heavy, uh, very uncomfortable feeling liver. And for those patients, it can sometimes help to reduce that bulk and make it feel more comfortable. It can slow the tumor down. Uh, but as I said, we need to be very clear that it's not making it go away completely. Then at the MDT, we think, is there a clinical trial available? And there's a number of logos there on the left. Uh, within the UK, we work it very closely within Cancer Research UK, and both Graham and I work very closely with them and, and some of our clinical trials. We both also sit on the National Cancer Research Network Neuroendocrine Tumor Subgroup, which is a bit of a mouthful, uh, but through that we're able to influence and develop new clinical trials that are coming along together with the UK society, uh, UKINETS. And increasingly, we're going to be looking to the European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society for some of the trials that we're leading on in the UK to become Europe-wide, but also to be able to take part in some of the European-wide studies. Why, why do we do, do this? Well, we want to find more effective treatment. You want us to find more effective treatments. We want to understand who benefits most from which treatments. And I'll come back to that in just a second. Most of all, we want to improve survival, and I'm sure that you'd agree with me there. It's important to say at this stage that you opt in to take part in clinical trials. Nobody will be doing any clinical trials uh, on you without you knowing about it. We need to do that with your very express consent, and it's entirely voluntary, and you can withdraw at any time. Clinical trials now, quite rightly, are very highly regulated. Every trial has to be approved by ethics committees uh, and the regulatory authorities within each country. So this is all about your safety, uh, but also hopefully benefit to you and patients coming after you. I talked about trying to find out who benefits most. If you look at the crowd on the left, all in gray, that's what we're currently doing. So just to take an example, for a certain group of patients, everybody gets the chemotherapy. But we don't really know who's going to do well and who isn't. We don't know for whom that's the right treatment and who it isn't. What we do is we give the chemotherapy and then we find out on a subsequent scan whether the tumor has been controlled or whether in fact there has been no effect from the treatment. So we're now in a new era uh, where we're using much more molecular diagnosis. And you may have been asked more than once maybe uh, to give an extra blood sample or to share the biopsy that you've had done uh, particularly when you're taking part in clinical trials, because we're trying to find out exactly how we can tailor the treatment so that, first of all, it's most likely to work for you if that's the right treatment, but you are spared unnecessary effect, side effects if it's the wrong treatment. And at this point, I just want to really pause. As some people I can recognize in the audience who have taken part in clinical trials, uh, without patients like yourself, without the support from your families, we wouldn't improve the treatments. Uh, and so uh, a, a thank you from the, the whole team for anyone who's participated in a clinical trial. 
We do also think about whether we should be using targeted radiotherapy, and I'm going to back off this one because that's the presentation from our speaker uh, after the break, Professor Injamori. I also need to answer the question, in my role as the oncologist on the multidisciplinary team, do we need chemotherapy? Sometimes it's very straightforward. You do need chemotherapy. These tumors are aggressive to start with. I've talked about the grading. So for grade three tumors, we tend to use chemotherapy sooner rather than later. Some tumors tend to start off relatively quiet, but as time goes by, they can become more aggressive. We don't always re-biopsy, but if we see that the tumor is becoming more aggressive, say on a CT scan, uh, we may then use chemotherapy at a later date when we didn't use it necessarily at the beginning. And what we want to do with chemotherapy, it doesn't make the tumor go away completely, but we want to make it much more quiet, much less aggressive, uh, but it'll still be there. We do need to decide where the primary is. And that's because not all treatments that we currently have available, we can use for wherever the primary site is. So as you know, these neuroendocrine tumors can start really from most organs in the body. And for most of the, the, the primary sites, the treatment options are fairly similar. We can think about surgery, we can think about interferon injections, which are injections aimed at using your own body's immune system to fight off uh, the, the neuroendocrine tumors. We can consider chemotherapy, radionuclide therapy, liver-directed therapies. So those, we don't necessarily make a decision based on where the primary tumor has started. However, last year we saw two new treatments that came uh, over the horizon for patients specifically with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And those were tumors that were gradually getting worse. Or within a year, uh, they had deteriorated. The two new treatments are everolimus and sunitinib, and these are tablet-based treatments that we know, again, are not magic. They won't make the cancer disappear completely, but they can slow down the growth of the cancer, and, and we know that they, they both uh, have that similar effect. Thankfully, this isn't usually one of the questions that we have to deal with. Is, is there a funding issue? I said to you at the beginning that NICE hasn't given us any guidance on how to manage patients. Um, Professor Postlin is probably much better placed to answer this question as he's involved in some of the national commissioning uh, for neuroendocrine tumors. But thankfully, we are able to genuinely make a decision on what treatments you need, the availability is there. Um, although uh, both sunitinib and everolimus haven't been approved by NICE, they are available through the Cancer Drugs Fund. Uh, and in fact, this is something that is fairly widespread across the UK, so if we need it, we can then use these treatments. So to just sum up, we know there are many treatment options available, uh, and deciding which and when, and to be honest, if at all at certain times, is the most important thing, and we do that through the whole multidisciplinary team. Without any trials, we won't get any new treatments. So I'm grateful for anybody who's been involved in research. I would encourage you to do so. And I'd like to just reassure you that there are no decisions currently made purely on funding. Thank you very much. <laughs>